ladies and gentlemen, if we could make a start on this session. Um, if we could make a start on this session, which is focusing on higher education, and in particular how we can extend higher education opportunities uh, much more widely in our societies, including by the use of online technology and uh, the new in vogue term MOOCs, Massive Online Open Courses. Uh, we've got a, an extremely uh, distinguished panel, but I wonder whether you could begin by giving a very big round of applause to our students, Khadija Niazi, who's come to us from Pakistan to tell her about her own experience in using MOOCs and logging on at the age of 12, logging on to online courses in American universities. This really is the new frontier of education. She's come here to talk to us about it this afternoon. It's very daunting. You may not understand how daunting it is to speak to you, but it's extremely daunting. And I think we should give her a very big round of applause for coming and <laughs> joining us this afternoon. And uh, I'm going to ask Niazi to speak to us first for a few minutes about her own school and how she accesses and uses higher edu education courses in order to develop her own education and interests. Niazi. Can I go to the podium? You certainly can. If you'd like to speak to the podium, that's fine. Hello, everyone. Um, so the new generation, uh, the children, uh, they are blessed with many things. I mean, we, you know, we have the fast changing technologies in our home, like um, smartphones, smart computers. So uh, it's entirely upon us how to use it for learning. I was born and there was a computer in my home. I remember taking my first online course when I was hardly a two-year-old. I mean, I actually learned my phonics from an online free site. I learned rhymes, maths, and science. So uh, my education literally started online at home. Now, this does not mean I was not given books, but I was actually given more choices to learn from. And internet was one of these choices. Um, there are lots of activities involved in learning online, like quizzes and games. Like when I was learning uh, vowels, the woman in computer even sang poems for me. I used to color the vowels, click them, and I could hear their pronunciation. So the instant feedback we get from these things are very important because they make learning online fun. Let's imagine, I want to know some science facts. I would just go on the internet, open a browser, and search. Only three steps required, and there I have the information right in front of me. It's fast, and it's free. And that's what we need to promote, isn't it? Uh, free and easy access to get education uh, for every child and adult, no matter how old the person is where he lives, how much money they have. Education will reach them in all that they need to do is embrace it. This is the beauty of learning online. I mean, you have this great teacher to learn from, and that too really at any age. So you no longer need to wait to learn your favorite subject in your O levels or A levels. If you have trust in it, you can learn it from an online source. So when I started taking online courses, I was amazed by the variety of courses. And to tell you the truth, when I enrolled in a course called Artificial Intelligence, I didn't even know what it was about. But I enrolled in it and later found out what it was, but I also found out that it was no child's play. But then I thought that if I even learn 0 0.1% of it, it's called learning. And I learned a lot, more than 0 0.1%, of course. So what I mean to say is that I was not afraid to try. And after I finished this course, it actually got me interested in statistics. So I took a course for statistics and completed it with distinction. But the point here is that the final 
exam of that course was really a final exam. I mean, like there was this question which I was stuck on for, for about three long days. You know, you have to search the internet, watch lectures again and again. So if someone thinks learning online does not require effort or hard work, they are in for a big surprise. You should have the will to learn. Only then can you learn. So be honest with yourself when you're learning because uh, learning without effort is not fun nor challenging. Because you don't learn anything like that. It's like flipping through pages of a book and not really reading anything. So now when education is no more confined to the premises of institutes like colleges and universities, you can learn anything under the sun, but only if you have the will to learn. So uh, imagine now that education is available 24 hours a day at the convenience of every student. I mean, it's great, right? You can just log in anytime you want, start doing a course of your choice. So uh, another thing is that these uh, online MOOCs have actually allowed us to learn from prestigious teachers from prestigious universities, which otherwise is not so easy for every student. I mean, like people dream of going to these universities and uh, I think their dream in a way has come true because the elite universities are now coming to us. So I just completed a course called Introduction to Astronomy. And if I ask any university to give me admission because I want to learn astronomy, they will simply refuse me and tell, look, you don't have the right age, not the background, and you didn't even do your A-levels or O-levels. And even if you did, you probably didn't have the required subject. Well, they are right, but now MOOCs have changed all of this. So students can get a line and explore new subjects. So many people often say to me that, why don't you get the books of astronomy? They are also available. But I would tell them that I think so getting lectures from a renowned professor is far more interesting than reading just a book. So many young students are now getting, uh, getting access to these sort of subjects and well, not in my life of these 12 years could I have imagined that I would learn astronomy at the age of 12, but here I am. I mean, there is no barrier for any CUNY student because now education and technology is helping us to remove these barriers. So online learning has actually opened the gates for you. So why don't you just walk right in and explore your interests? Another thing is that all these courses which I'm telling you about have forums. This is a place where you can interact with your fellow students and have healthy discussions about your course. My own experience from these forums is very positive. I mean, I was helped many times whenever I had a problem understanding anything. So forums actually allow us to become this big global classroom which helps each other out. So now I want you to imagine such a classroom and the process of learning. And now I want you to imagine its impact on our society. I mean, it's unbelievable, right? So now there are also lots of duties for the parents because the parents have to instill that hunger of education into the children. Like um, tell them that it's a beautiful feeling to have education. Uh, give them access to it, give them choices, help them explore, facilitate them, and they will surely not disappoint you. Now, being a girl, I want to represent all the girls in my country and in the world who some way or the other have been unable to get education. And I want to tell them that's their chance now, whether they're a housewife, 
a working mother or a student. They should just get online and educate themselves. Imagine where the world could be where billions of women have the knowledge of physics, philosophy, or history. Very well done, I think it's brilliant. Well, ladies, I don't think, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think your reaction was nearly positive enough. I think you need a much, much bigger round of applause for Khadija than that. It was fantastic. I think you may just have seen the future education minister of Pakistan. And what a, and what a wonderful rallying cry, not only for all of the force of, of higher education and all that we can do with new technology and all that is possible to mobilize across the world, but also I thought what Khadija said about the education of girls and extending opportunities in ways that simply haven't been, uh, been happening in, uh, in the past was fantastic too. Thank you. If I may say so, you are the most brilliant role model for your generation, Khadija, and the fact that you are here today being videoed, I think you may find yourself an online sensation yourself being exhibited in MOOCs across the world before too long. Uh, Professor uh, Bean is the Vice Chancellor of the Open University, which in its day, it was launched in the 1960s, pioneered new forms of education, what was then called the University of the Air, it pioneered radio and television as a means of delivering lectures. It was revolutionary in its day. It's still revolutionary in the way that it extends courses uh, uh, nationwide in the United Kingdom and internationally using online media. And he's gonna tell us how he sees the future. Professor Bean. Thanks. Well, good afternoon, everybody. How unfair is that? Having to follow Khadija, it's, it's not fair. But if you have any doubts about uh, her ability to inspire, her 12-year-old twin brother is sitting right there, and he's very cranky that he's not up here talking to you today as well. So congratulations to your whole family, sir. It's really, really remarkable, and a job well done. All right, so um, I think one of the critical questions that I was asked to address today in this session, and what we're trying to answer is whether we, uh, will kneel, will, whether we all will still need to go to college or university to learn in the future. That's certainly what the press has been trailing uh, of late, and I, I think in some fairly dramatic and sort of um, binary ways. As the Vice Chancellor of a university that for more than 40 years now has been bringing world-class learning experiences to people in their own homes and workplaces, as Andrew said, I have to say one thing, that no, we do not have to go to college in order to learn. And I think we just heard that eloquently expressed to us. Add MOOCs into the equation and suddenly we can offer free of charge world-class learning to every corner of the globe. And when you make education available to the whole world, the whole world stands to benefit. Now some people question whether higher education should really be a priority at all, given that we live in an age in which more than three quarters of a billion adults can't read and write. Surely we should tackle that problem before we start looking at improving access to university courses. And of course we should do everything we can to raise educational standards at the most basic level. Literacy is one of the greatest gifts we can bestow on one another. But this isn't a zero sum game, ladies and gentlemen. We can only tackle one problem at a time is a fallacy. For example, the Open University in partnership with UKAID has just launched a new program called Teacher Education Through School-Based Support in India or TESS India for short. It's going to provide a massive network of freely available distance learning resources to help train more than a million teachers across the country. We've already used a similar scheme to train more than 400,000 teachers in sub-Saharan Africa. The zero-sum view also ignores the vast unexplored potential of countless millions of individuals around the world who may have the wits and wherewithal to enjoy higher education but have simply never had the opportunity to access it. Earlier this year, Daphne Kohler from Coursera, one of the leading US MOOC providers, made the very good point that MOOCs are vital because we don't know who the next Einstein is. It could be a teenager in an African village or, of course, a 12-year-old girl in Pakistan. But it's also true that he or she may already be an adult, someone who has a huge capacity to learn and analyze and innovate, but who has never had access to the education they need to make the most of their talents. It's a bit like that scene in the movie Goodwill Hunting, 
where Matt Damon sneaks into a lecture theater late at night and solves all the complex mathematical equations on the blackboard. But instead of waiting for people to come to our blackboards, MOOCs allow us to take the blackboards to the people. Of course, MOOCs are not perfect. Hundreds of thousands of people are signing up to the courses, but only a fraction are completing them. Allegations of plagiarism and cheating and assessment are widespread, and they're proving hard to deal with. And there are signs of a MOOC backlash in the media. And uh, as some of the people on the stage will tell you, when the media starts backlashing, you know you're on to something good. The Washington Post recently featured with thinly disguised glee the story of a MOOC that went horribly wrong. The course was badly designed, the technology didn't work, the students revolted, and the whole thing was scrapped after just six days. And as if that wasn't bad enough, you then discover that the course was supposed to be teaching the fundamentals of online education. <laughs> so yes, there are some problems to overcome. There always are when you create something new and exciting. But we can't allow ourselves to shelve innovation simply because it's not easy. The potential benefits of the new style of learning and teaching are huge and are matched only by the size of the risk we take if we don't engage with them. Last year, the Open University's Chancellor, Lord David Putnam, warned that if we fail to radically alter our approach to education, the very people we're trying to protect from rapid change could find that their entire future has been scuttled by our timidity. We can't allow our own fear of change, our reluctance to do things differently, to impact on education in what is a rapidly changing, rapidly evolving world. Yet that's exactly what many educators are doing. Not that long ago, back in Britain, I was talking to a 12-year-old boy, actually, who described going to school this way to me. You know, he said, Martin, going to school is like being on an airplane. You have to put all of your trust and confidence in somebody at the front that you don't really know. You have to sit down and turn off all your electronic devices. <laughs> the problem doesn't lie with the device. It lies with the way it's used and what it's used for. And certainly how the person doing <coughs> the teaching allows it to be used. Back in the 1970s, the Open University embraced the most high-tech device of the day to educate citizens en masse. A, a technology so revolutionary at the time, yes, color television. Since then, we've progressed through VHS to DVDs and from television to YouTube. And this year, we've launched OU Anywhere, a world first that sees all of our undergraduate and postgraduate taught materials available on smartphones and tablets. When the first FutureLearn courses launched later in the year, our own MOOC phenomena, the generation that has grown up accessing online content wherever and wherever they, wherever and whenever they choose, would be baffled if we suggested doing it any other way. But that doesn't mean we have to sac sacrifice quality. We never have and we're not about to start now. Yet in many circles there remains this outda outdated idea that online and distance learning is somehow less worthy than the more traditional models and less effective. But here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. There is great teaching face-to-face, -face, and there is lousy teaching face-to-face. -face. There is great teaching online, and there is lousy teaching online. The goal for all of us needs to be great teaching. The factor that dictates whether a student will learn something isn't the mode used to deliver the education, it's the fundamental quality of the education itself. Nothing matters more than the quality of the teaching. So it's not about whether campus courses are better than their online counterparts. It's about how we can all offer the best education to all of our current and potential students. And it's not about whether we have to choose between brick and mortar uh, or online. It's about having the courage to move from brick and mortar to click and mortar to provide as much access to people as we possibly can throughout the world. It's a demand that cannot possibly be met by traditional models alone. You simply, we simply, cannot build enough universities to satisfy the demand for higher education around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, MOOCs are by their very nature massive. 
and they have the potential to bring about change on a massive worldwide scale. This goes way beyond borders, democratizing education and making world-class learning available to literally billions of people. Half a century ago, our Prime Minister Harold Wilson um, gave a speech in which he talked of a world being forged in the white heat of a technological revolution. Announcing plans for what would later become the Open University, Wilson warned that the future would be no place for restrictive practices or outdated methods. Today, we are all living in that future. If we're going to make the most of it and pass on something worthwhile to the next generation, we can't stick to the restrictive, outdated thinking of the past. We have to create and embrace new ways of thinking, working, and teaching, and we have to start delivering that vision today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. And uh, you heard his slogan, from brick and mortar to click and mortar. I'm not quite sure what the mortar is in the click and mortar, but <laughs> no doubt he has had us over questions. It's now my very um, uh, great pleasure to welcome Her Excellency, the Minister for Education from Nigeria. And uh, we're delighted to have you with us this afternoon. Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start by sending a goodwill from my president, Dr. Goodluck Ebele Jonathan GCFR, who was invited for this forum, but because he couldn't come, he asked me to come and personally represent him. And I'm happy to have, to share with you some of the experience that we are having in Nigeria on higher education and the issue of open and distance learning. Realizing that providing quality education to millions of Nigerians at the tertiary level has been one of the challenges confronting the education sector in Nigeria. In our efforts to solve the problem of access to tertiary education and provide the critical high-level manpower needed for development, new universities, private and public, have been established to meet the demand of our teaming youth who are yearning for tertiary education. Currently, we have about 135 universities in Nigeria. We have colleges of education as well as polytechnics, but we are yet to provide access for all. Hence, open and distance learning has become imperative for us to address this challenge. The concept is in conformity with one of the objectives of our national policy on education, which says that maximum efforts shall be made to enable those who can benefit from higher education to be given access to it. Such access may be through universities or correspondence courses or open universities or part-time e-learning and work-study programs. The practice of open and distance learning in Nigeria takes various forms, including correspondence study education, sandwich programs, part-time teacher training program, open university, weekend programs, and e-learning. The National Open University of Nigeria was established in 2001 by the former president, Chief Olishegun Obasanjo, who provided the impetus and commitment for the growth of the institution by enrolling into one of the programs of that university. So our former president is also a graduate of this university through open and distance learning. National Open University of Nigeria has provided instruction for many students through the use of new information and communication technologies, and it has study centers across the country. Yet we are facing challenges in order to address that. Some of the challenges include inadequate number of teachers with the required skills, I'm happy with the presentation earlier made on Nigeria. I will say one or two things about that. Non-availability of necessary infrastructure, including computers and allied tools for open and distance learning delivery. Incessant power failure creates problems for the effective integration of most instructional materials in the delivery of open and distance learning in Nigeria. Access to telecommunication tools, such as telephone, the internet and computers is still very low 
in Nigeria, and low societal estimation of the value of the certificate from the open and distance learning systems. However, the Ministry of Education for Nigeria has been proactive in taking appropriate steps to improve the integrity and service delivery by National Open University of Nigeria. The PPP in higher education in Nigeria, a major initiative in investing massively in education at all levels through public-private participation was the setting up of the tertiary education trust fund. This was a fund established as an intervention in order to improve the quality of education in the country. It is a 2% education tax on the accessible profit of all registered companies in the country to improve the quality of higher education. And I wish to state that any higher institution of learning you go into Nigeria, you will see the effects of this fund. The fund ensures provision of educational facilities, instructional development, teacher education, library development, and development of ICTs, among others, to Nigerian public universities, polytechnics, and colleges of education. We are also engaged in partnerships with qualified local and foreign private companies to operate, build, operate, and transfer scheme for the provision of decent and affordable students' hostel accommodation in the public tertiary institutions to meet the needs of the increasing number of students in the nation's universities and tertiary institutions. And realizing the fact that the world is moving towards the reality of the fact that we need students who must have developed their skills to be, in, in, in part to be employed and participate in the world of work. So as such, we realize that we can't do that alone. We have been partnering with the private sector, and I'm happy with the Dangote presentation, and realizing that the fact that technical and vocational education in Nigeria has also been facing challenges. So we are now coming up with a very big committee that will be partnership, that will have partnership and to be driven by the private sector. And I'm happy to say that the person that is going to lead technical and vocational education committee for Nigeria to revive in terms of having students to develop skills in their various institutions is Al Haji Ali Dangote, who is the chairman of that uh, Dangote group. And I believe that to that committee will go a long way in enhancing the participation of our students in terms of pairing what they may learn in the institutions to be relevant to the society in their places of work. So we are working with the private sector, and we have so many challenges in the country in part of, uh, as far as education is concerned, but we are working with the private sector, with other individuals that are interested, and NGOs, to help us in terms of developing, working our, on our own strategy that we have developed. We came up with a four-year strategy plan for the development of the education sector, which we believe in the next three, three years, when it is eventually actually actualized in terms of the process that we set for that, uh, definitely will go a long way in enhancing the quality of education in the country. Right now, we are faced with a large number of out-of-school children, which we are working on. I'm happy to see our little girl here. We are battling with girl child education, and I'm happy about the comments she passed to her fellow girls out there. And we believe that with that, we can make a difference. So we thank you very much for the opportunity. Your Excellency, uh, thank, you, thank you very much thank indeed. You. And uh, it, was, it was also exciting to hear about the development of the Open University in Nigeria. Open universities are clearly uh, the flavor of the year at the moment. Um, now, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Jean-Éric uh, Granat from the Université Pantheon Assas in Paris, who's also, also going to talk to us about our favorite subject this morning, which is the development of online and open universities. Hello, everybody. It's very impressive to speak just after those great orators. So um, I'm not a great orator like them. Um, I will talk to you about what we've done at the Sorbonne, because my university is part of the Sorbonne in Paris, um, which is quite an old institution. And we, we went into this, you use the word, Mr. Bean, a revolution. Uh, being online is a revolution for most of us because we were taught to teach to our students uh, directly, uh, eyes and eyes. 
And the revolution was made when my president asked me to first reduce the cost, because basically this is what uh, it was uh, the basic question. We had 1,640, that's very precise, students um, in first year, and the idea was to teach them uh, English, because you know that we French people are, are not very good for foreign languages because we've got a great opinion of our own language. <laughs> and that was quite a challenge, not to reduce the cost, but to teach English here again. Um, so I said yes. I said, yes, I think I can do that if I can use <coughs> online education. My president was quite surprised. He said, do you think you can teach a language online? Yes, sir, I think I can. And we started five years ago this experiment, following the path that had been started by um, Mr. Bean and all the, the people who started in the 60s. That's a long time ago. We started <coughs> only five years ago at the Sorbonne, and I was the only teacher. So that was a great cost cut, wasn't it? The prospect was to have normally 90 teachers to teach to this great number of students. So one instead of 90, you can imagine how my colleagues considered consider me after that. They wanted, of course, to fire me at the Sorbonne, uh, but I resisted and we went forward with this experiment, trying to find out what could be best for our students. Uh, we had a very highly motivated student this morning with Khadija who explained that she likes to go online. Not my students, I may <laughs> confess. Uh, most of them need the push. You know what the push is? Some of you are teachers um, or even parents, so you know that you are the push. When you ask your, your, your students or your kids to wake up in the morning to go to school and they grumble, uh, that's the push because you say, you have to go. Uh, what do you do online? There is no push. Most of the time, you're at work while they're supposed to be online. Believe me, they know how to go on Facebook very easily. Um, it is easier to, to go to this direction, Facebook, rather than starting a course. So this question of push and pull was very important to us. So the idea was to transform our teaching. This is basically what we've done. The idea was to reverse the system also. Our experimentation was to change <coughs> everything. Being a teacher, uh, I was told for a very long time that was, would be a very important person in my life. You know, being a lecturer at the Sorbonne, you can imagine I was uh, at the end of my career, not at all. I learned to learn again uh, in order to have a better teaching. You all know that the teaching, the classical teaching, is uh, on the model of a cathedral. You've got the students in front of you, uh, like today, you know, uh, which is not a good example of the collaborative talking, certainly. We change all of that. Our teaching is made for each individual who wants to join the, our teaching. And behind the scene, we've got now a group of 20 teachers, a group, a team of 20 teachers creating the course for one individual. So we reverse the system. Instead of having, let's say, 20 students in front of one teacher. And these teachers, so I told you it is to teach English, uh, so at the end of course I realized I have to uh, ask natives to be in my team, and I've got only a group of natives, but from all over the world with strange accents, you know, not like yours. And Lord uh, Adonis. Um, my team is coming from Australia, New Zealand, the United States, what a strange accent too, um, India, Pakistan, Iraq, can you imagine that? But they speak a good English, all of them, even if the accent is not what we used to teach at the Sorbonne, their English is perfect. And my students were confronted suddenly to a new world, a new world of different accents, different people. And that was the beginning of changing the way we were teaching, basically. 
the push and the pull I was talking about. Here we had a new pull, a new reason to do online, to be confronted to those accents. That's just a, a one thing that I'm not doing because time is, is running very shortly. I'm not going to develop all the resources we have created, but basically we have created a catalog of resources starting from a newspaper issued every week, which is created to be close to what the students are talking about. For example, uh, today, at the time I'm here in Dubai, no, yesterday, excuse me, my team issued a new publication and the cover was Pope Francis because it was the important news in the world and our students are supposed to know that in the English world, the Pope is not called François, like in French, but Francis, like in English. It may appear to be odd for you, it is not. You know, all those names which are different um, are, are important to be taught as well. You cannot invent them. So it is important to confront those students with the real world at the real time, not to teach with these old methods that were used in the 60s. I'm not, don't say that for you, Mr. Bean, of course. I know that uh, your university is up to date, but most of the time when you teach a language, it is with old methods which are not interesting for our students. Why not? Because our students have got high expectations. They are really up to date. Have you heard about Khadija uh, a few minutes ago when she told you that she was online? It was very fast. She was waiting for blah, blah, blah. The same with my students. You know, when it seems to be too old, too slow, or not according to what they were waiting for, they grumble again. They <coughs> telephone, they send a message, they say, you know, this time it was not that good just like in a class, and we've got an exchange. Uh, our revolution, this is the point I wanted to go to, has been made through collaboration. The online world for me is collaborative. And this is what we have developed at the Sorbonne. Collaboration is made threefold. First, it is made through teachers. I told you that we are a team this is quite a revolution to have a group of teachers working together, if you know what I mean, in higher education. Most of the time, we are alone conducting our own research and dispensing our knowledge to our students. Here, we work with a group of 20 people working to together, some of us having bright ideas from time to time, this might happen, but not necessarily me, even if I am supposed to be the leader of the group. And that is the big new thing. Secondly, collaboration is between the students. What Khadija didn't tell you, but she told me uh, just before the conference, is that she is interacting with the other students. That's very important. Because my students never interact. I mean, when we have a live course, they never. When we ask a question, most of the time, I, I'm waiting for the answer. This is in the French system. I'm sure in your country it's totally different, of course. But uh, this is how it is most of the time. Here online, the students, because they've got the possibility to post anonymous message or non-anonymous message, do interact and exchange ideas one with the other. And the third one, this collaboration, was with partners. Whoa, what a strange word for a university teacher, you know, having partners, private partners. I know that many people are talking about that in this forum. We are not reluctant to have private partners at the Sorbonne, not at all. We think it is very important because our job is to teach. Our job is not to develop and expand these methods. That's another job. It is for other people. I've met some of you. I talked to some of you who are uh, running a company, explaining that you were able to expand this knowledge because you've got a brilliant idea. Most of the time you have. Your ideas are fabulous. This is not my job. But I know how to teach because I've been formed for that. That was my training. So this idea was to interact also with the private world and it works. More and more, we are trying to develop this new method of teaching. So uh, I go to my conclusion. Um, the, the question is, does it work? Because this is the only question we have to ask ourselves. 
uh, I could say to the parents, yes, it does. We are tracking the students. We know that they are online all the time, and we know exactly what they are doing minute per minute, second by second. Wow. Even if they try to do an exercise and don't go through it, we know that. So we're able to, to say also exactly, like a specialized doctor, you know, the problem is here, because this exercise has not been done, but that's not the important thing for me. Um, does it work? Yes, the cost has been cut by 90, as I told you at the beginning of my expose. Uh, does it work? Yes, the students come online. And according to all the surveys we have made, they say they like it. Fair enough. If they like our teaching, you know, we are very happy teachers, aren't we? Um, does it work? I think it works more because of one other thing. The thing is that I've got more and more students uh, complaining, saying, you know, you could improve your system. I've got ideas, and they bring their ideas. One of those ideas is to have human beings. Wow. Does it work, or is it a failure? When a student asks me to put human beings. So we started one year ago to think about the problem, and we said, what can we do? And we went towards blended learning, putting live conversation at the demand with native speakers. And we were very surprised because those courses are all the time full. And we've also observed that the students attending those conversation classes go more online. So it is a cycle. And the students are asking for both systems. So our conclusion was that it works for those who are good enough to work by themselves. And it's fair enough, and we're very happy with that. It works with the handicapped people because we provided them with a new method of teaching at home. It works when you want to be uh, free, totally free. Choose the time when you can have your teaching. It works when you are, want to be creative because we leave part to creation for our teachers and our students. But at the same time, it doesn't work for a category of students who want more, the push. So our concern is to have a balance between the pull and the push all the time. Even if we put a great emphasis on the pull with all the resources that we create uh, online, but we try not to forget that the push, the parents, the tutors, the educators are very important. This is um, humbly what I wanted to talk about today, to share with you my experimentation and maybe answer your questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Brenner. And uh, you heard there the, the story of an ancient university which is at the cutting edge of the modern. Uh, we now have a quarter of an hour for, for questions, and I would invite you, there are some roving microphones going around, I'd, I'd invite you to ask questions. I'll take the questions in, in a group so I can bring as many people in as possible. The, uh, the lady at the, at the front, you can't really, is, is there a roving, roving microphone or? Yep, it's just coming towards you in the front table. And then we'll go over to the side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Azel Shimeri. I'm the education lead uh, for Microsoft for the Gulf region. This has been really an inspirational and fantastic panel. I just have one concern is that uh, are we seeing in higher education an evolving uh, new digital divide? Because one thing is the availability of content, which can be available for, for free, but really the challenge is uh, to provide uh, devices that are both affordable and efficient, and issues like connectivity. So unless we ensure that these uh, factors are also present at a very, very affordable level, especially to emerging markets, we are really seeing the evolution of a new kind of divide that you know companies like my company and also the manufacturer of devices should uh, you know, uh, be uh, working to um, eradicate completely or to evolve in the right direction. Microsoft provides the majority of its services in education for free, but we really need to see another push from the hardware um, uh, providers
to create the kind of devices that will be available in the hands of Africans, where I come from, from countries that are on very low per capita income in Asia and in, in Latin America also. Thank you very much indeed. Are we seeing a new digital divide? I, I saw a question here on this side, and from the only one on the table behind. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to congratulate first you know, the speakers. Uh, but, um, you know, I see uh, uh, online uh, education as an opportunity to, to broaden access to uh, higher education and, uh, and other types of education to many citizens in the world. Uh, however, um, from a point of view of a citizen from a developing country, I see uh, some challenges. Uh, for example, um, it's much, it, it is much easier to expand access to courses which do not require labs and workshops. And how can we go about uh, you know, delivering good quality courses uh, for areas where we need labs and workshops? Because these are great danger that you know, we can uh, have theoretical engineers, uh, theoretical scientists, theoretical you know, doctors that do not have opportunity to practice. And I would like to hear some comments on this because I see that as a potential you know, um, challenge uh, because uh, otherwise we who are in the developing countries, we unfortunately will always perpetuate uh, the expansion of courses that they don't need all these requirements, like courses, you know, that you know, based on paper and uh, you know, uh, crayon or something like this. So uh, I would like you know to have some comments on this. And the other uh, problem that we we face also in developing world is the access to affordable um, uh, broadband. Yeah, it costs money. And uh, some of the countries cannot afford to have access to uh, quick internet because uh, without you know, a good uh, access to internet, or you know, this uh, is just dream to many of the developing countries. And finally, I just want also to say that um, not all the things that are uh, on the web uh, are to be seen as truth. We need to teach our students to uh, look at these materials critically because there are so many lies there and uh, things that are not true. And sometimes we have got a tendency just to see printed material or materials on the website as you know, the truth. And this is misleading. Thank you. Thank you very much. So how do we substitute for labs and workshops online? That's a very big and important question. On, in, in the front here, please, yeah. Um, so I think what I took away from this session is that online and distance learning can often fill the void in terms of instruction and information. But a lot of students go to university because it provides them with access to a network of employers and other people who are similarly interested. What potential do you see, if any, um, for this void to then be filled and for distance and online education to play a bigger role in the labor market for potential employers and for potential people as graduates in the long term? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. How do you substitute for networks and social experience with, with online courses? Another big and important issue. Uh, in right in the middle, I see a, quest a question. Rashid, is there, have we got our microphone coming towards the middle? Thanks very much. I'm very upset. I'd like to congratulate, uh, especially the little girl who spoke so eloquently well and uh, uh, opened a new way into uh, learning. Um, while uh, it was said also that uh, there should be the brick in the mortar and click in the mortar, but uh, balance has to be struck in between, like I say, there's fantastic um, teaching face-to-face, -face, and there is lousy teaching face-to-face, -face, and uh, there is fantastic teaching online and could be lousy teaching online. So my question is, 
shouldn't we, it's all very well for us as, edu as educators to sit and say, yeah, online te uh, teaching and online learning is the new and the, the modern uh, way of learning. But my question is, shouldn't we be striking a balance in between those two? Because there are advantages of one system and there are disadvantages, and there are advantages in the other system, and there are disadvantages. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we have time for one last question. The lady I see on the side, the microphone is coming towards you. Um, <coughs> hi. Um, the Middle East and UAE in particular, they are opposing online studies, although as you can see a little over this, there could be really good online studies and also really bad online studies. What can we do to change the government's mind that it's really a good thing to have online studies? Thank you very much. Well, a wide range of questions there. I wonder uh, whether I could ask Khadija to start, to start with, who studies online in Lahore, isn't it? It's, it's Lahore that, that where you live. Can you tell us something about the equipment you've got and the availability of broadband? It'd be good to hear from you on this issue of the digital divide, how you yourself manage to access these MOOCs from the other side of the world. Um, there are some problems always, but overall I can do it, but the, sometimes the broadband goes down or there's a new problem also in our country, which is that the YouTube is banned, so I can't access the Udacity videos. But as um, I told this problem to the course, uh, the course people, they solved it by giving us offline download videos. And for those people who don't have access to broadband, there are many like net cafes available where you can pay a certain amount for going there for an hour or so. So you haven't found access to equipment and broadband a problem in, in pursuing your studies then, Kadi? Uh, the, the YouTube one was um, affected my studies a lot uh, because I was on the finals of physics course when the YouTube got banned. Mm. But uh, later I posted it on the forums. So the, they reacted very quickly and so I was able to watch the videos. Well, that's very encouraging. And you heard it here first. Across Pakistan, MOOC cafes are springing up oh. at, on, <laughs> every, on every street corner. Oh. Uh, Your Excellency, on the issue of encouraging online learning, the question was posed what more governments could do to encourage it. What view do you have as, as an education minister on the encouragement of further online higher education? Yes, uh, as far as Nigeria is concerned, as I mentioned earlier, realizing the fact that we cannot reach that target that we set for ourselves, to have more and more graduates of secondary education to go into tertiary education, especially universities, we have no option but to encourage them to enroll in our National Open University, which I mentioned that even former president who initiated it is also a graduate of that university. So what we are trying to do is to enhance the capacity of our study centers. We have study centers that are branches of this National Open University in all the states of the Federation. So what we are doing is to enhance the capacity of these study centers and we ensure that each of the students has his set of textbooks. And of course, even though it is an open and distance learning opportunity for them, but there is always a time that is specified for them to report to their various centers where they will have direct contact with the various instructors. So we are trying to encourage and to motivate our students so that they can see the value of that open and distance learning. And we also do not discriminate between the graduates of the regular university and the graduates of this open university, because as they graduate also, we certify them and they go and undergo the required national service, which every required and recognized graduate of the university in Nigeria also undergoes. So we are trying to make it attractive and we are trying to motivate the students by having more qualified teachers, because the challenge we are having in Nigeria across the entire education sector is the issue of teachers, which I think I began to measure. So we are trying to employ more and more qualified teachers so that we can ensure that we give proper learning through 
open and distance learning, and we offer them the same opportunity with those from the regular institutions. And we believe that we can maximize the opportunity in open and distance learning. In Thank Nigeria. you very much. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. And Professor Brenner, this issue about how do we substitute the labs and workshops and more practical based courses online, what view do you have on that question? Um, <coughs> yes and no. This is what I think is nice to say. Um, online teaching is is certainly a, a great improvement for many people who are too far away from a university who can afford a university because in many countries it's costly or we've got a handicap, that's for sure. Um, besides that, um, online teaching is also a fantastic tool for all the students who are working, for example, which is very often the case, um, who want to, to to have more time, to save time and organize our time differently. But, uh, as I mentioned, um, I think that the, the classical university will remain and, and for long, and that's a good thing uh, also. We need to have the, the classical teaching for research, for um, the university life as we know it for ages. And at the same time, we need also to have a transformation of this uh, transmission of, of this teaching for the future, because um, more and more people are, um, are achieving secondary education and are now um, uh, going through uh, uh, higher education, what was not the case in the past. And that's also a good thing. So uh, I would say that, yes, the, it is a substitute for many people who were able to, to go through the substitute, but most of the time, here again I go back to my idea of pull and push, it is absolutely necessary to have the classical education maintained for, for, the, the, for, for having also a high quality, you, you mentioned that Professor Bean before, that that's very important, you know, uh, to, 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 I'm going to give you an example and then I stop there. Um, my major is not teaching English. My major is to teach uh, uh, British law and politics. Um, my students need to have the best um, teaching as possible on, on that behalf. So to achieve that, I must conduct researches, publish these uh, researches, uh, of course, uh, so that my colleagues can check that my teaching, is my researches and my teaching are of course, the, the best as possible. This is how the university works for ages. And this must be done also um, in the future. The teaching which is now online will be coming from this. It, it will be um, the, the, the end of the, the process, I would say. Uh, it cannot replace it, uh, not at all, not uh, for, uh, on the point of view of the researcher that I am, the lecturer. So that, that is important to keep it as it is. And it, I think it will be kept by the university community. Um, so I, I don't know if I answered the, the question. Thank enough. you very much. And then Professor Bean, this issue of the digital divide, how are we going to extend the opportunities you talked about when people don't have equipment and when broadband is in many areas patchy at best? Sure, so you know, I think uh, one of the things I've come to learn over my whole career being at the intersection of technology and education is you take the technology and use it as and when it's available. Uh, I don't think one size fits all. Uh, I don't think you should hold back progress in innovation and disruption um, because technology isn't freely available or bandwidth is freely available everywhere in the world. However, you do need to use the technology of the day. Just about everybody in the room has a weapon of mass distraction in their pocket that they've used during this session. <laughs> um, if you take our English in Action program in Bangladesh, where we're training 25 million people um, in concert with UKAID and the BBC to learn English, you know that piece of technology we're using? A Java feature phone, a sub $15 American phone that everybody's carrying in their pocket. We're putting all of the learning materials on a micro SD card. We're using that to play videos to train the teachers. We're plugging in a low cost speaker in the classroom to run the lessons and we've reorchestrated it around constructivist learning and the outcomes in the classroom are miraculous. So I don't think we will ever be able to, in the march of technology, 
always make sure that everything is available to everyone, but boy, to our peril, will we not use it as and when it's available. And I think Khadija did a wonderful job of talking about how internet cafes and other ways of accessing broadband on a fractional basis can open up opportunities. The young man that asked the question about the network very quickly, can I just give a quick answer? I, I was kind of, uh, it was kind of ironic to me for you to say that online restricted networks, uh, as we've been speaking, I suspect you've been tweeting. So you have actually opened up a very physical presence to people throughout the world in their millions. The best answer I can give you is LinkedIn, not Facebook. If you want to talk about the power of what you can do in virtual spaces to build online communities of people and networks for very powerful employment outcomes, go no further. Thank you very much. And could we give a, a warm round of applause to all our panelists who've given us such stimulating <laughs> presentations this afternoon.